Okay, so I'll talk about kind of a few different settings where um, even in the case where kind of you have less data than you like, you can do maybe surprising things. So, um, okay, so the sort of high level question we'll be talking about, so say we are given data um, drawn from some complex distribution. So think of it as just independent samples drawn from some complex distribution. Um, so, you know, what do we mean by complex? Um, so maybe the distribution is kind of some high dimensional real valued distribution. Um, maybe it's some um, distribution over a very large um, discrete alphabet. Um, maybe they're very complex dependencies, um, what have you. Um, so given data drawn from some complex distribution, um, if the amount of data is not kind of enormous, the empirical distribution of the data might be misleading. So the you know, empirical distribution might not be that accurate a reflection of the true distribution. And the question is kind of in this sort of undersampled regime, um, you know, what can we do? Can we accurately recover information about the true distribution? Can we estimate properties of it? And so on, okay? Um, and, you know, there, I mean, there are a few motivations for this. Um, so one of the motivations is that, you know, there's this kind of apparent paradox. So, um, you know, even though we've, we're, data sets have been growing, we get more and more data. In some sense, we're increasingly in this kind of undersampled regime. It seems like even though our data sets have gotten really, really big, we're even more ambitious in terms of trying to figure out um, properties of extremely complex distributions and somehow, you know, um, seems like we're increasingly faced with this kind of undersampled regime. Um, I'll give a few examples in a second. Um, the second motivation is this kind of uh, more high level thing, right? So like machine learning has made huge progress in the last maybe 10 years. Um, and, you know, by and large, um, you know, well, some of the main contributing factors to this are just that we have you know, much bigger data sets than we had before. Um, and, you know, it seems like if one would hope to make comparable advances in the next 10 years, we probably should be getting more information from each data point, right? So, you know, look at, look at kind of the big impressive uh, machine learning accomplishments, you know, image classification, uh, natural language stuff. They're not using the information they have all that efficiently, okay? Um, so just to throw out some numbers, um, so humans learn to speak pretty decently after hearing maybe like 50 million words. So in the first uh, you know, four or five years of life, children hear kind of 50 million words. These aren't distinct words, right? Most of the words are, you know, carrot, 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 right? Like most, uh, lots of repetition. Um, so actually, yeah, so that figure is from this pretty influential paper from the 90s that basically the punchline was uh, um, the difference between the number of words children of kind of lower income people here versus wealthy people is about a factor of two. Anyway, so that's, uh, um, but anyway, so, so children learn how to speak pretty decently after hearing 50 million words. And you know, our kind of best computer systems, you train them on the entire Wikipedia corpus and you keep giving them the Wikipedia corpus over and over again and still, you know, computer systems don't have a great grasp of, say, grammar or semantics and so on. Okay, so, um, so anyway, so this is kind of a background motivation to some of this work. So how do you get more information from each data point? Okay, um, okay so, um, so I'll talk about kind of three different things across the roughly two hours. Um, so the first work is, um, in some sense, you know, asking this like very, very basic question. You're given samples from dis some distribution over some discrete alphabet, and your goal is just to learn the distribution as well as possible. Okay? So we don't want to make any assumptions on the distribution. The question is, um, you know, how and when can you denoise the <coughs> empirical distribution? Okay? So you take samples from some unknown distribution. You want to output a good estimate of that distribution. And as we'll see, in some cases, you can actually denoise the empirical distribution. Um, and um, so kind of that work leads to a few uh, nice corollaries, which actually have some nice impl implications for understanding properties of the distributions of um, genetic mutations. Okay? And we'll, we'll sketch some of the applications too. Um, the the kind of second part of the talk um, is dealing with a distribution over the reals. So imagine you're given um, data drawn from some high dimensional Gaussian. 
So you have some Gaussian distribution in d dimensions. And in the regime where the number of samples is, say, much less than d, um, you know, in many cases, you don't have enough information to, say, accurately estimate the top principal components. Okay? So if you, you have some big Gaussian, maybe it lies in some lower dimensional subspace. But in the regime where you have kind of a sublinear number of samples, um, maybe you can't estimate you know, this low dimensional subspace. Okay? But can you still estimate um, the eigenvalues of the covariance? So can you still say something like, look, I don't have enough data to tell you which low dimensional subspace your Gaussian lies in. But I can say that you know, with high probability, you know, your data or the true distribution does lie in some low dimensional subspace. I can't tell you which one. I don't have enough information. But I can tell you that definitely does lie in a low dimensional one. So can you recover kind of the, uh, um, can, you, can you say what type of low dimensional structure there is in the regime where you don't have enough data to find the low dimensional structure? OK, so that's the second part. Um, OK, and the third part is, uh, is again, a so slightly different setting, where one has a matrix of probabilities. Um, and one draws independent um, ij pairs according to this matrix. And one observes this matrix of empirical counts. So you can imagine that you have a matrix of probabilities representing, say, probabilities of edges. And then you draw the adjacency matrix of a graph from this. You can also imagine uh, some different settings. And the question is, given, uh, you know, given this object, what can you say about this object? So these are three different settings where we're sort of going to investigate the extent to which you can sort of accurately say things in the regime where the empirical distribution, the empirical matrix here, the empirical covariance here, the empirical distribution here is kind of less accurate than you'd like. And how do you actually compensate for this? OK. Are we on board with the, with the plan? OK. OK, so, um, so just, OK. So, the first part of the talk will be in the setting. There's some distribution over a discrete support. So in this case, think of it as a distribution over species of fish. And we're given independent draws. Okay. So, um, so what, you know, what can we say about this? So the empirical distribution, so this is a, you know, in what sense is the empirical distribution of the sample good? So it's, um, you know, it's a maximum likelihood distribution. Right? It maximizes the likelihood of having drawn our sample. Um, but maybe it's not a good estimate of the underlying distribution. Okay, if we care about, say, estimating the underlying distribution in total variation distance, there's no reason to believe that the maximum likelihood distribution should correspond to the distribution that you know, minimizes the expected total variation distance. Right? These two things are different, right? OK. So, um, so one question is, well, you know, in general, can we denoise the empirical distribution? without making any assumptions on the structure of the true distribution. Okay, so can we actually correct for it? Um, OK, so, um, so maybe to start, I'll just give an uh, intuition that you, know, you can actually do something. Okay. So suppose we take a million samples, a million independent draws from some distribution. And we see roughly you know, 10,000 domain elements. And each, thing, each domain element we see about 100 times. Okay. And suppose we look at the histogram of the frequencies with which we see the domain elements. And we see something like this. Okay, so, so what does this mean? This means so there's a big peak at 100. This means that most of the domain elements we saw 100 times. And some things we saw you know, 120 times. Some things we only saw 80 times. Okay. So this is a histogram of the frequencies. You can think of this as the histogram of the histogram of our sample. Yeah? OK. Um, OK, so, so given this, um, you know, what distribution do we think the samples were drawn from? Or in other words, suppose I tell you, look, there's one some domain element, and I saw it 120 times. What's your best guess as to the true probability with, with which this species uh, occurs? Okay, right. And the question is, are you going to answer 120 divided by a million? Or are you going to answer 100 divided by a million? Okay, the empirical estimate says 
you know, 120 over a million, and I claim that you'd actually be better off answering 100 over a million. Okay, and so what's the reasoning? Okay, so I claim that actually you can essentially denoise this empirical distribution and conclude that the true distribution is very close to, say, a uniform distribution over you know, 10,000 domain elements. Okay, so you know, so why, why is this? So first of all, like, suppose the true distribution were uniform over 10,000 things. And you take a million samples from it, and you were to plot the histogram of the frequencies, what would you expect to see? Well, you'd expect to see something like this, right? Most things you'd see roughly 100 times. Some things you'd see a few more times. Some things you'd see a few, a few less times, OK? And if you think about this for a little bit, you would expect to see something like this that looks kind of like a Poisson distribution of expectation 100. OK, suppose that actually the true distribution had some guys who had, you know, Suppose the true distribution had some variance in the true probabilities. Some guys were a little more likely than the others. Okay? Then after you add in the kind of noise from sampling, you would see something even wider. That's my claim. Okay? Right? So in particular, if the true distribution had you know, this much variance in the frequencies, you had some guys whose true probability were you know, 120 divided by a million, and some guys whose true probability were only 80 over a million, you were to take a million samples, you wouldn't see something like this. You would see something that's even wider. Okay? So I claim, you know, at least in this case, we can kind of robustly conclude that actually the true distribution is very close to uniform over 10,000. And if someone says, hey, you know, what's the probability of this guy that only occurred 80 times? You'd, you could say, well, with good probability, the guy who only occurred 80 times has roughly the same probability as the guy who occurs 120 times, and this probability is probably very close to 100 over a million. Okay? So this is just one example of a setting where you can actually, um, to a significant extent, denoise the empirical distribution. And again, we haven't made any assumptions about the true distribution. We've only been reasoning based on what we observe, based on the empirical. Okay? Okay, so the question is basically, uh, um, how general is this reasoning? You know, this was a very special sort of thing that corresponds to uniform distribution. So in general, to what extent can we denoise empirical distributions and how far can we push it? How well can we, uh, can we do it? Okay, are, we on, are, are people okay with this example? Yeah, so, so I claim that the only distribution where this plot has such a tight, uh, you know, has such a small variance is the uniform distribution. And that if there's any variance in the true probabilities, that's effectively added to the variance of sampling and you get something even wider. Yeah. So, uh, Okay so, um, okay, so so what's our actual goal? So, so you know, in this last slide, we saw some sort of, uh, you know, some magic or something, and, and now we want to actually make, make it spe um, specific what we're trying to do, okay? So, okay, so our goal is going to be sort of optimally, some optimal denoising in every instance. Okay, so, so our goal, we're given n independent draws from some unknown distribution. We want to return some q, some distribution q, or vector q, to minimize the L1 distance, okay, the total variation distance. Okay, and what do we want? Well, we don't want to make any assumptions on the true distribution p. And, you know, ideally, we would like our algorithm to work, you know, as well as, we could po as possibly could be expected in some sense, even in hindsight, on every instance. Okay, so like if uh, so, we give our samples. We're going to output our uh, our estimate, and then if someone later on were to come and say, "Hey, you know, the true distribution is this other thing. Why did you do this?" We'd like to be able to explain. Look, we really did the best we could given our samples. Merci okay? de faire le silence so, et merci d'éteindre votre portable. Um, Bonne matinée. Okay, and somewhat surprisingly, we'll be able to actually actually do this. 
Okay, so, um, so yeah, so why are we talking about total variation distance? Uh, YL1 distance. So there, there are a few reasons. So, um, so in this recent work of Rolitsky um, and Suresh, which was one of the, I guess it was one of the best papers at NIPS this year. Um, so they considered kind of this sort of question for, you know, estimating the distribution in terms of L2 distance and KL divergence. Um, and basically show that an extension of kind of good Turing frequency estimation can, can sort of achieve something like this for those settings. Um, for you know, total variation distance, this kind of good Turing frequency estimation tools are not really what you'd like to be using. Um, um, so one reason why L1 is nice is if you can learn well in total variation distance, um, it turns out you can estimate properties of the distribution quite well, and we'll see this in some of the applications to estimating kind of uh, frequencies of unobserved mutations and this sort of thing. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so there are many other works on kind of denoising the empirical distribution. Almost all the ones I know proceed via kind of good Turing-inspired approaches. Okay, so so uh, how many people are like familiar with good Turing estimates? Right, so, um, so basically the, uh, right, so what's a good Turing frequency estimation? So, um, so Alan Turing and I.J. Good were working at Bletchley Park in the British World War II effort. Um, and they wanted to know, you know, what's the probability that the next sample we draw is a new domain element that we haven't seen before? Okay. I think, you know, they wanted to know what, what's the probability the next ciphertext that the Enigma machine outputs is a, uh, you know, a new ciphertext we haven't seen or something. Um, and it turns out that there is, you know, a very good unbiased estimate, essentially unbiased estimate um, for this. Namely, you want to know what the probability of the next thing being something you haven't seen is. And it's basically just the number of things you've seen exactly once divided by the number of draws you've made. Okay. So you want to know, you know, you're fishing, you're given independent samples from the distribution of fish, you want to know um, how much mass in the distribution consists of species you haven't seen yet. And you can estimate this by just the, you know, the, fra the number of species you've caught exactly once divided by the total number of samples. Okay, so given that you're, so you can think of this as saying you can estimate the amount of mass in the true distribution consisting of domain elements you haven't seen. So one natural thing is, maybe you should just scale things in such a way that this missing mass is taken into account. And I guess that's what I mean by these kind of good Turing-inspired approaches. So you know how much mass you're missing, and you want to kind of fit that in. Okay. Okay. And yeah, stop me at, uh, at any point if uh, things are not clear. So, okay, so, um, so our theorem is the following. So, given n independent draws from some distribution p, we're going to return q such that the expected total variation distance, again, where the expectation is taken over the, the uh, randomness in the draws. So it's going to be opt. I'll explain what this is. Plus a little o term that vanishes. And this little o term is independent of p. Okay, I can tell you what this little o term is. It's basically 1 over log n. So it depends only on the sample size and not on the uh, distribution uh, p. Okay. So th you can think of this little o term as just being 1 over log n. What is opt? So opt is going to be the optimal expected performance that any algorithm can, can achieve. Even an algorithm that gives, that, that's given the distribution p, but with the labels removed. OK? So you can think about it this way. So, so, uh, so what is opt? So opt is a performance of some algorithm that's given, say, uh, the sorted list of all the probabilities of the domain elements, but it's not given the labels. Okay? So if it's a distribution over species of fish, I don't tell you which fish is the most common, but I say there's some fish that has probability 0.3, some fish with probability 0.1, another fish with probability 0.05, and so on. Okay? And opt is the best performance of any, that any algorithm can achieve, even one that's given this unlabeled vector of probabilities. 
No? Um, Um, yeah, so, so you can think of what's out. So it's, it's going to be expectation over the randomness of uh, um, the sample. But it's for a worst case distribution. So you can think of it as saying we want to be agnostic between labelings. So what's opt going to be given? It's going to be given samples from a distribution with this vector of probabilities, but, but, but randomly associated labels. Okay. So you can think of opt as opt doesn't know that cod are more common than, you know, sharks. Um, it's given this, and it's and then the distribution will be. Uh, so, yeah. So opt is going to do you know as well as possible without having some, you know, prior knowledge about the labels. Think of that way. Yeah. Uh, Tends to zero. So, um, uh, no, so that's actually tight. Um, but yeah, so, so this is a good, a good question. Um, yeah, so, okay, let's look at this. Si vous êtes aux sciences, vous avez entendu parler de Poincaré. Vous avez publié des ouvrages de philosophie des sciences très populaires. Il était membre de l'Académie des sciences et de l'Académie française. Over. Uh, il était à la fois mathématicien, universitaire. Uh, K things. Okay. So truth is uniform over K. Right. But we don't know what the labels are. Okay. And It knows that there are K things and all of them have probability 1 over K. It just doesn't know what the labels are. So what does the algorithm corresponding to opt do? Well, every time it sees a new domain element, it says, aha, there's some domain element with this you know, label, and it occurs with probability 1 over k. But the domain elements it hasn't seen, it doesn't know what the labels are. It can't, it can't estimate. It can't do that. Okay? So if you think about what's the, uh, what's the expected you know, error of opt, Well, it's just equal to the, you know, the missing mass, the mass that it hasn't seen so far. Because these, so think about this way. This is saying, look, there's an ocean, there are K species of fish, they're all equally likely. Your job is to learn them, to learn this distribution. You don't know the species of fish that you haven't seen. Every time you catch a species of fish, you say, aha, I know that there's some cod, it's probably one over K. When you see some new, strange blue fish, you didn't know it existed before, now you caught it, and now you say, ah, oh, it's probably one over k. This is what opt is doing. Okay? So if you, if you look at the um, error of opt, so given n samples, so this will be as, the, as n increases, this is the error. Um, so it starts off at, when you have no samples, it starts off at one, because the algorithm says, look, I don't know what your distribution is. I haven't seen any fish. I don't know the species of fish ahead of time. Um, and then, so when you when you have, so, this, so when you have say k samples, what's the error? Well, it's just equal to the fraction of the domain you haven't seen so far, which is going to be what one over e or something. Okay, so this is one over e. Uh, I guess it's going to look like this, right? And you know, and then, and then it kind of goes down, right? But um, okay. And then you're asking, so how big is this extra log term? And the point is, yeah, it doesn't depend on k; it just depends on n, right? So this is this is the performance of opt, and we're saying, look, even without this information, we're going to achieve something like error this. Uh, sorry, error, you know, this, where this gap is a function only of n and doesn't depend on k. So, you know, for complicated distributions where kind of k is big, um, this log term isn't going to make that much of a difference. Okay, but, um, but yeah, so uh, I guess a different way of thinking about it, like the example at the beginning is, 
say you're given like 100 times k independent draws, is going to have error basically like one tenth because the standard deviation, yeah, it's going to have error like one tenth. That was that initial plot we saw of the variance of the of the kind of what looked like a Poisson. But how well will op do? Well, the fraction of the domain that it hasn't seen is like, you know, inverse exponential in 100, right? So, so there we're only paying this kind of log n rather than this kind of one ten. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so, how can you possibly hope to achieve this something like this opt with a small term? Well, the uh, have the maybe surprising intuition, both for the algorithm and the proof, is to argue that basically, if you're given enough samples that you can correctly label the domain elements, so we're given these probabilities. If I'm given enough samples that I can actually like add the correct labels to these guys.
Right, so going back, so, so basically, what's our algorithm going to do? We're going to try to recover very accurate estimates of this unlabeled vector of probability. We're going to effectively assume that these are accurate and then do what opt would have done with these things, which, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever is sort of involves a median, okay? Involves kind of computing the, you know, you're given this unlabeled vector of probabilities, given a domain element, you want to figure out, you know, which of these things, which of these probabilities are they correspond to. You think of things as a distribution over these probabilities, and then you take the median. Okay. Anyway. Um, okay. Um, okay, so how do you recover accurate estimates of the unlabeled vector of probabilities? Oh, sorry, question. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's actually, yeah, that's a good point. So, um, uh, yeah, so that might incur, like, I guess, twice the cost of opt. And in, so think about it in this example, okay? So based on this sort of shape, you kind of know that, uh, sure, the guys up here have a little bit of a higher chance of belonging to this big probability than the small one, but, you know that the noise from the sampling is going to be mixing things, okay? And given that, you'd kind of say, look, I think all of these guys probably have probability P. Why? Because even this guy up here, um, you know, doesn't have that much more likelihood to belong to 1.1 P than P. And given that most of the guys, anyway, 90% of the guys have probability P, you'd be better off saying they all have probability P. That's the intuition for why you don't just want to sort them. Yeah, yeah, but when you're, uh, you're still going to allocate 10% of them to the higher probability. And I'm claiming that this 10%, if you, if I were to ask you, in this 10%, what fraction actually have probability 1.1p? Your answer is going to be probably almost just 10% of them, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, no, that's a, that's a good point. Um, okay. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so how do we recover these unlabeled vector of probabilities? Uh, so it's basically just pinning down the kind of mental calculations we did earlier. So earlier, remember, we had this empirical frequencies. And we asked ourselves, what distribution corresponds to this? Namely, what distribution has a property that, that if you were to give, be given independent samples from it, your expected histogram of frequencies looks like this. Right? That's what we did. Right? To denoise this, we, said, we concluded that the uniform distribution is consistent with this because the expected observations in the case of a uniform correspond to this. So all we're going to do is make this rigorous. And it turns out asking to find a distribution whose expected histogram is close to the observed thing can be represented by a linear program. And this was kind of sort of a more refined version of a linear program in some work we had a couple of years ago. And given this linear program, feasible points correspond to unlabeled vectors of probabilities. You just solve it, any feasible point will do. Okay, and the, you know, what's the performance of this? Namely, you know, you want to argue given enough, you know, given a certain number of samples, you want to argue that kind of the diameter of this feasible region is small. So what can we say about that? Well, so given n draws from some unknown distribution, um, it could be a countably infinite alphabet, it doesn't matter. The linear program is going to return some, unlab you know, some unlabeled vector w that approximates the sorted list of probabilities for all the probabilities that are at least 1 over n log n. So namely, see, see the true list of unlabeled probabilities is like this. We're going to recover some vector Q with the property that if you look at the L1 distance between these things, it'll be small 
for the portion of these things whose value is at least 1 over n log n. So it's basically saying we're making no effort to do anything about the small probabilities. The guys whose probability are less than 1 over n log n, we don't, we're not going to hope to estimate them. But any probability that's more than 1 over n log n is going to be here, and we're going to, to get a good approximation of it in the vector we recover. Uh, so the total variation distance, the L1 distance between these two portions of these two vectors is going to be, say, less than some epsilon, some constant epsilon that you specify. So, okay. Uh, say these Qs are just the sorted empirical probabilities. What can you say? Well, say I have some guy that appears with probability 1 over n. I've taken n samples. The empirical probability of this guy is kind of accurate up to error, basically, you know, plus or minus 1 over n. Right? See some guy, the true probability is 10 over n. I take n samples. The empirical estimate will be accurate up to kind of, you know, square root of 10 over, over n. Okay? And after you add this up over kind of n domain elements, you get constant error. So the empirical thing is true if you look at the L1 distance for the portion of these guys down to probability something like 1 over n. And we're claiming that actually we can do better. We can get you know, accurate estimates down to this extra log factor. Yeah. Sorry, Jelani, you had a question? Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah, exactly. Great. So this is, uh, so this is the point that um, say your distribution has quite a lot of elements in this range. So we're accurately estimating this unlabeled vector of probabilities. We're saying we know how many of them exist with different probabilities in this range, even though you know, we only have n samples. We can only see n things. If there are lots of things with probability 1 over n log n, in here, like, we don't see most of them. But that's fine. We can still, you know, you know, think of it this way. Like, yeah, we don't see most of them, but we see a very small representative fraction of them, which is enough to infer the existence of the others and so on. Yeah, so, uh, so if you put a maybe epsilon squared uh, on the bottom, then the L1 distance will be less than epsilon with high probability. So again, so this is, look, so if, okay, so let me try to convince you that this is actually, like, you should be shocked that we can't do better. Okay? So suppose I tell you that we took n samples and we saw n distinct things, so we didn't see anything more than once. Okay? So what's, what's your guess of this distribution? Okay, so I took n samples, I saw n things exactly once. What do you think the true distribution is? Yeah, so, so you know, that, that's maybe a bit too strong. Um, but, um, but the intuition is right. So, so if I were to ask you um, what fraction of the probability mass consists of probabilities bigger than 1 over n, what would you say? So if I were to ask you, like, say we chop things off here, how, what's the sum of these guys? Yeah, yeah, so, so the answer is, like, you know, certainly much less than constant. Like, if there were, like, epsilon mass consisting of things with probably more than 1 over n, with huge probability, given n samples, you would see one guy at least twice. Okay, that's a birthday paradox, okay? And, and yeah, as Jelani is saying, yeah, so we can push it. Not, not just this is less than epsilon, but it's kind of, in some sense, less than 1 over n. Is that right? Maybe, well, maybe 1 over n to the alpha, for some alpha. Okay. Um, so, so in this case, we're basically saying that, like, we can accurately estimate these things almost down to 1 over n squared probability. 
Okay, we know that like if there's if there are lots of things whose probability is much bigger than one over n squared, then we get birthday paradox. We'd see some things twice. Okay, and you know this one over n squared is a bit optimistic. It's actually just one over n log n, but this is some intuition for why you should be shocked that you kind of can't do even better than this. Is that okay, Jelani? Or? Okay. Are you, are you, you're not, you don't seem shocked. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so, so building off actually what Jelani was saying. So, right, so uh, you know that given n samples, you're not going to see many of these guys. Right? You might see n of them, but if their true probability is like 1 over n log n, then you're not seeing a very big fraction of them. So the point is basically that uh, you can learn probabilities down to 1 over n log n, but you can't hope to add labels down this far. And even the opt algorithm kind of can't hope to know this many of these labels. And this is this kind of intuition for learning the unlabeled vector is easier than labeling. And this is why sort of we're going to be able to be competitive with opt. We can learn the unlabeled vector extremely well, in particular much better than uh, the opt will be at actually labeling things. So when we go to label, sort of the error in these unlabeled probabilities is kind of insignificant. This additive, uh, yes, 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 exactly. So that's like if all of the guys are sitting here, uh, then you know, or or they're all sitting here or something, then um, you know we're we're not we don't say anything we don't know what's going on, whereas opt says oh all of their probabilities are this and we will see a kind of you know one over log fraction of them, and yeah, exactly. Okay, so, um, so one like, nice corollary of this, which maybe will help uh, put a context around what's going on, um, is the following. So say we're given n samples from some unknown distribution, and someone asks, how many new domain elements do you think you'd see if I give you more samples? And based, given this, we can accurately estimate this for samples up to size n log n. So I give you n samples. I say, how many new things would we see if I were to give you a sample of size n log n? And you can accurately estimate this. Beyond this log factor, you can't. Right, so this is um, things like this. I mean, even in the like, 1940s, right, so there was uh, like this biologist, Corbet, who was collecting butterflies. He spent a year in the jungle collecting butterflies. Um, and then he mailed uh, R.A. Fisher with his data and said, look, I'm going to go back to the jungle for another year. Or, you know, I'm writing a grant. I, you know, I'm proposing going back to spend another year in the jungle. Can you estimate the number of new butterfly species I will discover if in the next year? So he discovered like 150 species of butterfly in the first year. And he wanted to know, can you estimate the number of new things I'll discover in the second year? Okay. Um, and this is saying, actually, he could say, you know, I spent, uh, uh, you know, I spent a year and I you know, caught 10,000 butterfly species. Can you tell me how many new species I would discover if instead of 10,000, I caught 10,000 times log 10,000? Okay. So not just a factor of 2, not just 2n, but log n. Uh, log n. OK. Um, so motivated in part by this corollary, um, and you know, some, some friends on the bio side we sort of uh, went down this path a little bit, and maybe I'll tell you a tiny bit about this. Um, and then that'll be it for the first part. Um, so, okay, so slightly different setting. Um, so instead of independent samples from a discrete distribution, think of kind of some genetic setting. So we have a genome of length. Uh, of length m. And each index in the genome, there's some probability, p sub i. And this is like the probability that that index is mutated. Okay? Or that probability that this index in your genome has a mutation. 
and think of each genome as just being sampled as you know, you flip independent coins at each position with the corresponding probabilities and that tells you which index, indices you have mutated, okay? Um, this independent uh, assumption is, uh, you know, not true in real life. Surprisingly, it doesn't seem to matter too much. So, okay, so, right, so these are, you know, our different, our different individuals have different mutations and they're all obtained independently by flipping these bits. So, Basically, the punchline is that in this setting, um, the results in the independent setting go through, but the effective sample size is equal to the number of people times the expected number of mutations per genome. Okay? So what was n before is now the number of individuals we've sequenced times kind of the, the number of mutations per individual. So this actually might be very large, right? We have 60,000 genomes. Each genome, each person has maybe 300 relatively rare mutations. This is like now a quite a large number. And the log of this is quite significant. Um, okay, actually, yeah, so, so just in the next few minutes, maybe I'll just kind of describe a high level why you might care about the setting. Um, so, you know, we have a fair number of genomes. So uh, I guess Europe has more, I guess, but um, so there, you know, in the states, the standard data set that's used is these 60,000 healthy individuals. And um, there's, I guess, a billion dollars of funding to sequence a million people. And people want to know things like, okay, we have these 60,000 people, 60,000 genomes. How many more new things, new medically relevant things are we likely to see if we were to sequence a million people? Okay. And, you know, this, this is... Uh, you know, this corollary is uh, as along those lines, okay? So um, just one specific thing. So, um, so at like the Stanford Hospital now, if you come in and you're very sick um, and, you know, with weird symptoms, you don't know what's going wrong, they sequence your genome. And there's some types of mutations that you see them and you know something's broken, okay? So these are known as loss of function mutations. And you see this person has this mutation and you know it breaks that gene, okay? Like, you know, genomes kind of had, you know, three, uh, three bases code for amino acids. If you mess up the, you know, the blocking, you kind of know that things are broken. Anyway, there are so there are certain types of mutations that you know break genes. Um, most healthy people on average have like one and a half broken genes. Um, okay, so sick person comes into the hospital. Um, you get your genome sequenced. They look to see which of your genes, genes are broken. And then for each of those broken genes, they look up in their database of 60,000 healthy genomes, and they say what fraction of these 60,000 people, or how many of them, have this broken gene? And literally, if the answer is more than five, they say, you know, it's okay to have this broken gene, it's fine. And if there are fewer than five healthy people in the data set who have this broken thing, they say, okay, uh, this might cause your issue. They look to see what this, uh, what this gene codes for. And the rhetoric is, you know, they see what it codes for, maybe make some protein. They say, oh, look, we have a bucket of protein. They take some, some of that, they inject it into you, and you get better. Okay, so in like 5% of people, this actually fixes it. The rest, they say, look, we think we know what's wrong with you. We can't fix it. So one thing people are interested in is, is well, if instead of 60,000 individuals, we had a database of, you know, a million healthy individuals, how many... Uh, how many more of these genes with kind of loss of function mutations would we be able to uh, see, okay? So anyway, so uh, this, um, so, so we can actually predict this stuff pretty well. So what is this? Uh, basically the same algorithm I showed you before, before works in this genomic setting. Um, so what is this? So we have 60,000 healthy people. And this is saying, suppose we only look at a tenth of our data. Suppose we only had 6,000 healthy genomes. And we wanted to predict, if we did have 60,000, how many more genes would we see that have a loss of function mutation in at least, say, 10 uh, of these people? Okay, so based on this little amount of data, we can extrapolate out what we would see if we had this amount of data. Okay. And, you know, the blue line is the average of our predictions average over different sets of this 10%. The red line, which is right on top of it, is 
the actual truth, since we do actually have 60,000 things. Okay, so our, uh, we're doing pretty well, and especially given that this is kind of a funny, funny curve. And now, you know, if you say, okay, well, now we do have 60,000 things, let's, ex let's extrapolate out. You know, one of the punchlines is that sort of, yeah, if you have half a million healthy people, you get pretty good coverage. This is plateauing. You see most of the genes that support loss of function mutations in healthy people. So we have like 20,000 genes. This means that basically like two thirds of them are okay if you break one of the copies in one of your, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You have one from your mother, one from your father? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, right, so, uh, yeah. so uh, most genes it's okay if you have one broken, what, about two thirds of them. And phrased differently, you know, persons in the hospital, they have this loss of function mutation. You can say, well, given that it doesn't occur in these other healthy people, maybe there's a, I guess there's like a 50% chance that it's actually okay. Anyway, biologists seem to care about this. I don't really know how to interpret it. Um, okay, that's gonna be it for the first part of the talk. Uh, so maybe we'll take a five, ten minute break. Yeah. But, um, okay. Okay, so we'll start again at 25 past.